Welcome to the 21st of May uh, Queensland Branch eForum. Uh, we'll uh, just have a brief introduction and then I'll hand over to Kate to get going. So uh, yes, we'd like to welcome everyone, um, not just Queensland, but uh, all over Australia and the entire uh, AIG membership. Um, hopefully you can all uh, attend as many of these uh, as possible. Uh, today's talk is from Kate Hines from MITRE Geophysics. Uh, her talk is The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, 20 Years in Exploration Geophysics. Uh, for those who are new to Zoom, could I just ask those, um, with, uh, just remind everyone that your microphone and cameras are inactive and uh, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function to ask your questions. If you use the chat, it gets lost, um, but uh, please put your questions in the Q&A and anyone who's interested in uh, promoting a uh, question, you can vote on those as well. Um, please submit your questions as they go. Uh, we'll uh, save them for the end, but it makes it easier if everyone um, asks their questions as, as we go. Uh, we are going to record this, and as we have recorded our other ones, and we'll be posting them on the AIG YouTube channel uh, in due course. Upcoming events, we have a uh, Friday QAQC for Exploration Mining Seminar. Uh, it was planned to be run just before the uh, lockdowns, but we'll uh, try to get that one going um, as soon as practical. It will be a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar in Brisbane. Uh, we'll also have a joint AIG uh, Geological Society of Australia Queensland branch and OSIM talk in June, just confirming the dates on that one. Upcoming uh, talks with the AIG ALS technical meeting series. Uh, we'll have the uh, Chilico Red Dome talk from Cam Schweitzer and Newcrest coming up in a couple of weeks, June 9. Uh, July we'll be talking about some uh, bauxite. We'll also be looking at uh, carbon sequestration, um, MISMA gold deposit in PNG, uh, WKP uh, epithermal deposit in Waihi and uh, still looking for a November talk, so keep your eyes open for that. The RPGO eForum series is something new we've uh, started rolling out. This is the first of the actual uh, RPG categories that we're running. Um, so thanks, Kate. Uh, coming up uh, will be a mineral exploration uh, talk on June the 4th uh, on declining discoveries uh, with an expert panel, including Tim Grask, Richard Shoddy, and Malcolm Norris. Uh, June will also host one on geochemistry. Then we'll follow up with hydrogeology and information geoscience. And we're continuing to plan those as we go along. The RPG AE forums will continue as an online only event, whereas the AIG AILS uh, monthly technical talks will eventually revert back to being face to face um, events at the Transcontinental Hotel in Brisbane. So, uh, to get things moving, um, Kate is going to talk, as I mentioned, on the good, the bad, and the ugly 20 years in exploration geophysics. Kate is a versatile and successful geophysicist who's worked with all with some of the most interesting companies and exciting deposits in Australia and worldwide. She has made several major discoveries through a combination of technical expertise and equally important um, integration with the full exploration team. She firmly believes that if you want to be successful, you need to draw on experienced open-minded expertise from across the disciplines and integrate them into an enthusiastic team that knows it can and will find all deposits. So without further ado, I will uh, hand this over to um, Kate, as soon as I can stop this. There we go. I'm just sharing my PowerPoint screen, hopefully. I hope you can see. Yes. All right. It is a tough gig talking to my paint in my office, um, but it's much more fun when I can see all your beautiful faces. But these, this is modern times and we get to, to have geophysics taught to you from, or spoken to you from outside your computer screen, which I'm sure will make it even more interesting. So, uh, I hope you can see, I'm not sure which screen I should be looking at, but I'll look at my, my actual laptop screen. So MITRE Geophysics. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt, you're sharing the wrong uh, screen. I'm looking at the wrong screen. <laughs> Great. I don't really know which way to do that. 
with how to get around that? Uh, when you go to share screen, you've got the option of which screen to share. Uh, and I think you're sharing the wrong one too. Just unplug the other one. That should um, that should make it simpler. Is that better? That's got it. All right. So today, Mitre Geophysics, we are a consulting company. It was established in 1980 by John Bishop, which was incidentally the year I was born. And um, and we've been working together on and off over the years since um, since the late 1990s. So um, I tend to work for medium-sized mineral exploration companies, the ones that don't quite have the um, the turnover to, to hire their own geophysicists full time, or for example, the larger companies that might need need some specialist expertise in, in certain types of geophysical methods. So. The talk basically will just give you a quick refresher on what is um, EM and IP because they're the two types of geophysical methods that I refer to in this talk the most. And there's a tendency for me just to use short words referring to them all the time. And I, and I realise that you guys don't necessarily live and breathe electromagnetics and induced polarisation. So it's good to just do a quick refresher. And then I'll take you through five different examples. It was hard to pick. Um, the examples for this uh, this talk, but I think these are the most, I think a really good wide variety of, um, of different applications of geophysics and I see some good successes and, and really spectacular failures as well. So EM, electromagnetics. So EM works on exactly the same principle that your car alternator works. That is a changing magnetic field um, changing in time or in space will um, will induce a secondary um, current to flow in anything conductive, and then we can we can actually measure the little magnetic fields associated with those currents flowing in the conductive thing, and um, and those and we can use those secondary fields to map out whatever it is. So in this particular example, we've got a this is a downhole EM system, so we've got our surface loop. Um, on the surface and we have a basically a very simple electrical current in that surface loop that we're turning on and off, on and off, on and off repeatedly, you know, every 25, you know, 25 times a second or 10 times a second or whatever frequency is appropriate. And then in this case, the little receiver probe, which is this black um, box, is going down the drill hole and it's mapping out these secondary magnetic fields caused by the currents induced in this little conductor, which in our case we hope it to be a, an ore body. Now, if you took your downhole receiver and you walked it along the surface instead and left your transmitter loop fixed in place, that would be fixed loop surface EM. If you took your transmitter loop and moved it along at the same time as you're moving your, um, your receiver, then that's moving loop EM. And if you took your hole, your transmitter loop and your receiver, stuck them beneath a helicopter and flew along at 100 kilometers per hour, then that is airborne EM. So there's um, the, the the nomenclature is fairly 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 similar no matter what. Obviously, when you do everything at 100 kilometers per hour, you pay some real penalties in terms of data quality. So I was, there's a there's an example later on in the talk today where a very large ore deposit was completely missed with airborne EM. So induced polarisation is um, a very different type of method and actually it was developed to, uh, I suppose, overcome some of the limitations of EM. And with EM, to get those circulating electrical currents, you, it has to be a pretty good conductor. You have to have quite a lot of sulphides in one spot or graphitic shales or something like that. All those things give you good EM responses. Now, particularly with porphyry copper exploration, they weren't seeing the massive sulphides. And so you weren't get, getting any response to real, um, real typical sort of a, a, a typical EM survey. And so, but they did find that all those tiny little um, grains in the ground that disseminated sulphides, when you apply an electrical car charge over them, they actually polarize at each, at the boundary of every single grain, the, um, the ions basically polarize. And when you remove that, um, that primary field or that um, basically just two big electrodes plugged into the ground, when you turn that, um, that charge off or that primary field, potential field off, sorry, 
um, those little grains depolarize. So the ground essentially, essentially acts like a big capacitor and the amount that it stores electricity is related to the, um, to the volume of, uh, of disseminated sulfides. It's related to a lot of other things, but that's one of the things it's related to. And that has an advantage that for, for certain targets, it can, um, it can produce a better response, particularly for, I mean, often for, for many ore deposits, the halo of disseminated mineralization is actually much larger than the, the main economic ore zone, which means, and you've got a larger target to find. So using IP, you're trying to find something bigger rather than maybe something that's too small or too deep to be found with something with just EM alone, just magnetics alone or something, or gravity, for example, alone. So IP is well established and it's definitely having a renaissance in, uh, in the lock and fold built right now in the application for exploration for uh, porphyry copper deposits and in that particular case they're doing a lot of MIMDAS which is like a um, which is like a thinking man's version of IP a very a very good quality version of IP. So I'm sort of wrote this talk from the perspective of a exploration manager so you've got a um, a, um, a very deep for example a mine and um, and it might be one or two kilometres below surface. And drilling, drilling from inside the mine is often quite difficult because you're drilling sub-parallel to your target zone. And that's a very common, very common problem. But then once you've already got a mine, you're already, you've actually already done the hard work. You're already actually quite close to where you want to drill. So how do we get around the fact that we might be drilling something very narrow, but we're drilling sub or down dip or long strike and therefore drilling parallel to this, um, this sulphide ore body. This particular example is the Endeavour mine. And the Endeavour mine, you can see like this is um, a thousand metre level, uh, 10,000 up here. So it's about, um, about 800, 1,000 metres below surface by the time you get down to the, the core of the, the mine. And, um, and so to drill out, to drill anything around the mine, you're looking at 1,500 metre holes. Very, very expensive, long holes, easy to go awry. Now, in this particular case, the exploration was focused on mineralization below. This is a long section. So the, if you can imagine, there was like a skirt of mineralization down below the mine. And it was um, on, the on the intersections with the sediments that the mine is hosted in and the basement limestone. And it was very hard to drill from within the mine because they were basically drilling a very thin sheet directly down dip. And in this case, to drill at any significant distance below the mine would have taken 1.8 kilometre surface holes. So Endeavour Mine, the mineralisation is pyrotite, a lot of zinc, but a lot of pyrotite. It's a perfect, perfect target for EM. So what we said, um, they approached John Bishop and what he suggested is that we should put out a loop and uh, and use the edits so, uh, along the drives and down the edits, and that would be your underground transmitter loop. And the reason for having it underground is you get it a lot closer to your target, and you also get a much better, um, I suppose, better energization because you're away from the conductive overburden, which sometimes can absorb a lot of the field. And so that's that green line on this figure. And then in the, um, we actually put a second loop out, and this is a horizontal loop as well. So you had a vertical loop and a horizontal loop. And the second loop just went across, the, the whole body's so thick that it was possible to actually put a horizontal loop, but it was only, so let's say, 50 or 100 metres across and then the length of the mine, which in this case is, two, is, is about 1,000 metres. And so we surveyed these three holes here. And you can imagine it was a bit of a, an operation getting this, this, this wire out in an underground situation, but we had the, the support of the mine team. And they drilled these holes specifically just to do the downhole geophysics. And there was also this other hole that they were drilling to the north. And, um, and that was open, so we said we'd survey that as well. And you'll see that um, this hole was dipping quite shallowly. That's about the minimum depth you can have, minimum dip you can have for a um, gravity assisted downhole EM survey. If it's an upward hole, horizontal or upward, you have to look at pumping or um, pushing your, um, your probe up the hole. 
So this is cross section. So this is our main ore zone. That's that big long pipe in that previous figure. And here's our skirt. There was actually a similar target on the other side where they thought, well, is this stuff, is it, is it worth really making the effort to, to, to put a drive down to get a bit of drilling, better drilling angle for these things? And so what they did is they drilled some um, holes from within the mine parallel to these, um, this, they knew there was stuff down there, but they just didn't know how big it was and um, if it was worth making the investment to maybe drill some, some surface holes to get a good estimate of thickness and grade. And because you were just drilling exactly down dip. This is another view. So this is a plan view looking from surface and that's that skirt on either side of the ore body. In this case, we're just looking at the Western side and you can see the target zone there. So this, this because the ore zone seems to be an anticline and with a fault zone and the mineralization appears to be approximately centered around the change in plunge. So anyway, so that was the target. So we, we've, done, we've got me in a bogger. I got, got in trouble because I took my glasses off for the photo. And, um, and this is the, just to refresh the, these underground loops to put it, they're about a thousand meters by 500 meters in sort of 400 meters vertically type thing. Anyway, so we did the survey and um, these are a couple of the different models. So this is, it showed the rough size of these plate conductors. Now this is, fortunately I couldn't find the original modeling project for this. So I've lost all the details on this, but from memory, they're about a hundred meters by 200 meters, these individual um, uh, conductors. And they were enough justification to, um, to send down this parent hole here and wedge off it. So these were 1.8 kilometer holes. And, um, and so the, basically the EM was used to define whether or not it was just little bits of sniffs that they'd got in the very limited drilling or if there was some significant spatial extent. And what they found there was um, enough spatial extent to justify the, the surface drilling. Interestingly, in this hole, to the north, I also sort of um, mentioned an off-hole conductor. And um, in this particular case, basically the geologist in charge of the whole mine and a lot of the um, exploration team had a complete turnover after CBH had some troubles, I think maybe, I'm not sure of exact details. But um, so he was sort of in charge of, of this project. And then I think when he left, a lot of the knowledge of what was going on with the geophysics left, they got enough to sort of follow up these things. And this, um, and this conductor up here, it was, you can't really, I haven't got it on this plot because I don't have the original data or the project. But um, it actually turned, they, um, I, I was talking to someone in Broken Hill a few, uh, uh, six months ago, and they mentioned that they drilled out and they'd found a, um, a, an extension to the ore zone in that direction. And I'm like, well, I mean, didn't we find that when we did the EM years ago? And it turned out that it didn't actually, um, because this, of the change in management, there hadn't been the, the importance of the downhole geophysics results hadn't been fully, or well, I suppose the EM plate models hadn't been fully utilized. So shows that sometimes a really good handover is an important um, side of an exploration team as much as actually doing the work itself. So there's some, um, some, some of the different models. So quite extensive, but it just didn't have the, um, the metal content to warrant an extension in that direction from memory. So, Next question, next problem, problem number two. This is our VHMS um, and, um, and this is unfortunately how I get called into a lot of projects is the holes being drilled, but they didn't get anything. And this was a, a fairly, um, fairly typical example. In this case, it was Steve Collins had, um, had been doing a lot of work for a company called Triosmin and they had just um, on, on a project in near about two hours south west of Sydney called the Woodlawn Project near Tarago. And, um, and it was a pretty busy time of, time of uh, the exploration industry, 2012. And so um, I think they called him up and wanted to do some, you know, wanted to do some downhill geophysics. And he actually suggested that, that they call me up because I might be um, more available in that type of project. So in 2012 in Woodlawn, They'd been drilling and I don't believe they had a lot of money left in the budget. They'd been drilling and, um, oops, uh, these deep extensions to these um, ore zones. So you've got 
all these sort of WLTD series holes, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, and they've been trying to find extensions to these. The Woodlawn, um, uh, to these lenses. Now, Woodlawn still had a lot of metal in the ground, but it had been um, high graded, if you like. So when the mine was um, in its latter stages in the 1990s, uh, sort of a lot, a lot of the mining hadn't gone towards extending or keeping mine life. It's, it had gone towards cash flow. So what metal there was, and um, and 8.4 million, 8.4 million tons um, of good grade polymetallic is is not inconsiderable. Is um, was largely in remnant pillars and on the fringes and all over the place, and thus it wasn't quite economic. So what they were trying to find was a real solid um, extension to to the lenses, if that makes sense. Anyway, once again, deep drilling and expensive drilling for a company with not a lot of uh, money in the bank, um, a pretty um, high risk option, but it was a, you know, economically, it nearly was there. So they just needed one good intersection. Anyway, they drilled WOT12, WLTD12, which is a 900 meter hole and hadn't gotten anything. And so, one of their geologists working on the project, um, Eric Conahan, who works used to work for WMC, and he had a very strong foundation in the use of downhole geophysics, particularly given the um, the, the man isotype um, type ball, ball style, and and so he suggested, well, well, how about we do some 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 downhole downhole geophysics? And so that's when I got the call. Now. I didn't actually say yes when they called me up because um, they said, "Well, the hole's ready now, and we're going to we're going to grab we're going to fill it full of concrete in a couple of days. And the the drill rig's sitting on it; um, it won't be available once the drill rig moves off, won't stay open. So, can you get a, a downhole EM crew here in two days?" And I said, "No, that never happens in two days. They just normally it takes just a couple of weeks for them to get all their you know get to that wherever your your hole is or you know wherever your project is." But it just happened to be, I called around all the different contractors and it just happened to be that Outer Rim, who are now high power EM, Outer Rim were on site and well, passing by and they literally just, just drove in and started pre prepping for the survey. So remembering with EM, we have transmitter loops. And in this case, they're not perfect rectangles because it's a mine site. Um, it doesn't actually matter if they're not perfect rectangles. It's just as long as I know what shape they are, that's all I need. So I put up two loops because you weren't 100% certain what the orientation of the mineralization would be. And um, outer, outer rim came on site and, uh, and put the loops out, obviously. The, the, the contractor normally puts the loops out and, um, and set up and haul and began to survey. And the reason we do two loops is the, the second, in, with, with downhaul EM, the, the transmitter loop has to be located correctly with respect to the orientation of mineralization. That's not always directly above the mineralization. If you've got a um, vertical conductor, for example, your transmitter loop will have to be off to the side of that conductor so that you get the correct coupling. It's called coupling. And coupling it can be greatly important. If you're not sure of your exact geometry of your ore lenses, then, then doing two loops is a good idea to um, minimize the risk that you um, that you didn't didn't get your coupling right in the old days before three component probes they used to do five loops you know by by moving the loop around you could tell where the actual ore deposit was and what its orientation was because on the loops that were poorly coupled with mineralization wouldn't get the response compared to ones that were well coupled with mineralization it's just like the loop is like a big torch so you have to shine it the right way to actually correctly illuminate what you're looking for. So this is the, um, this is the open cut at Woodlawn. It's actually Sydney's waste dump. Now I'm gonna try something complicated, uh, which should work, it'll be fine, right? So I'm gonna share. And I'm gonna share this. I hope you can see My um, NCOM PA screen, it'd be good if someone could tell me whether or not they can see it. Uh, yes, uh, it's all there, we can see it. Okay, great. All right, so this is the all lenses at, at, um, at Woodlawn as they were in 2012. Obviously that's the, the original all lens, if that makes sense, not the mined out all lens. I haven't put the pit on, but 
and it should, if I move it around, it's pretty easy. The lines here are 500 metres apart. So that gives you a pretty good indication of how, I mean, everything's, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big VHMS, typical multi-lens sole VHMS. Anyway, so they drilled this hole, WLTD12. And what 12 was looking for was extensions to C lens. And C lens was really um, one of the juiciest lenses. And the idea was, well, maybe there wasn't a lot of drilling around this part of the world. So maybe there could be an extension down here. And if that was the case, that would be a really strong, strong economic viability of the, um, of the, the existing resource. So Adarim got on site and obviously we're looking for sea lens. So my brief was, well, we should survey the bottom part of the hole. And that had been the case at Woodlawn when they did surveys, which was only very rarely, rarely, they would just survey the part of the hole that was near where they thought they might have some mineralization. And I can understand what the reasoning for doing that. It saves money, less time spent actually surveying. Down the M cruise costs about $4,000 a day. So if you could save half a day here, that's $2,000, right? So. It's a, it's a good reason for, for shutting down the survey early. So that was the original set of data. And what we've got is just a very narrow in-hole response related to a small amount of copper mineralization that's from some stringer zones around. This is actually J lens here. So it wasn't, it wasn't that um, attractive from an exploration. It's certainly, it's, it's, it's a typical of an in-hole response. But what we definitely don't have is any form of resp response from you can see them as very narrow bits of mineralization in 12, and that's the stringers from the tails of sea lens, but nothing, there's no sign of a big conductor near the hole down there. So I said to, um, to the client, in this case, Trialsman, I said, you really should. I mean, we've paid the money to get the crew there. You know, we've paid the money to lay the loops out. Um, may as well survey the rest of the hole. And Eric Conahan really pushed that um, as well within the company. And they said, oh, okay, yeah, we'll survey the whole hole then. And, um, and that's what we got for the rest of the hole. So now this is how DM data looks. It's four dimensional data. So you've got your spatial information, then you've got the temporal information as represented by this, um, each line is like a slice of time after the transmitter turns off. And what you see is that late time channel, late to mid to late time channels here. These are early time up high and mid to late time up down low. Um, we've got a, a response typical of an off hole conductor. And I thought, ah. Oh, well, that's interesting. We couldn't survey any higher because there was um, metal casing in the hole down to 200 metres or something like that. But, well, that's interesting. Um, I'll do a model of it. That's my job, do a model. And um, I didn't really think that there was room, you know, that's what a pretty typical it was, it, was only, it was 120 metres by 120 metres, this conductor. It was decent size. It had a conductance of about 150 Siemens, sort of fairly typical for a VHMS. But what I did know is that was also a lot of historical in-mine workings. And, and I just thought, you know, I said, look, there's this conductor. It's not explained, um, but, um, you know, it's... Here it is, here's your rectangle. So, you know, rectangle, I can understand if you're a geologist looking at a rectangle, it's pretty unappetizing. And it really didn't seem like there could be something significant, so shallow. So, with, I mean, we're talking, we're looking, this is 400 meters above where anyone was looking. Everyone was sinking deep. This is way up high, way up near the top of the workings, really. Anyway, there didn't seem any possibility for, um, for it to actually be anything, because it's, it's a mine. It's been drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled. But um, fortunately, I've managed to put uh, a lot of holes on there that shouldn't be. Just fixed it as quickly. But if you actually, this is, this is, a, this is a, the Woodlawn Drilling Day database in approximately 2012. If you actually go in, what you can see is that, um, damn it. Sorry guys, thought I had this all sorted out for you, but turns out not.
that it actually hadn't been intersected. This hole here wasn't there at that stage. I don't know what hole that is. There was only one hole, this hole here, which seems like it was actually drilled subsequent. There was only one hole that went close to this plate and it had a small amount of copper. And these holes I've coloured copper, 2% copper is red. So there was only one hole. This other hole did not go through the plate at that stage because it didn't exist. So you can think uh, an area has been drilled out, but when you actually zoom in, you start looking at the forest for the trees, we have somehow managed to fit 100, 100 by 120 metre lens um, into this area. Now we said if it was 20 th metres thick, it would be, from memory, we thought it was somewhere between 500,000, could possibly be up to a, a million tonnes, but I also said, look, I'm not sure because it could equally be maybe some old copper wiring in the mine, like if there was original, you know, an original mine comm system, that could be the type of thing that would cause um, cause this type of type of response. And to me, it seemed really e weird that, that there wasn't actually drill holes. I thought maybe they just know that there's a graphitic shale in this area. That's why nobody's drilled over here. Anyway, um, they then drilled, uh, that was WT12. They drilled 13 and 14 and then came back and drilled WLTD 15 in 2000, I think it was the next year or the following year, 2014, I'm not sure. And they intersected 30 metres at um, a, a good grade massive sulphur. It's like a whole new lens to the mine. And I didn't actually, at the time, I didn't find out, find out about this. How I found out about it was someone called me up and said, um, um, congratulations. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? They said, did you find a new four lens at Woodlawn. I was like, oh, I don't know, really? What? I had no idea. And they said, yeah, it must be you. It's called Kate Lens. So they, the mine geologists um, named it after me. And that was, I think, a, a lovely thing because I think it's probably the first um, ore of any type that's had a geophysicist's name on it. I think the paintwork in my office is looking suitably impressed at this point. So there's the... Um, this is, um, I thought I'd include this here. This is, uh, we did a bunch more EM surveys here and this is um, sort of like the final models of, of the actual lens using the EM. And the reason I put there, put it on there is I wanted to show you the resource. So that's, we did a lot of holes around this area, possibly one or two too many, I think. And then um, the EM indicated it extended up that way. And, um, and I think it's a pretty, like, that's the sort of, like from the perspective of using, like realistically, when you get to resource drill outs, you're probably not going to rely upon downhill EM, but it, it, it sort of gets you, shows you how close you can get um, rectangular plates to look like an ore body. And the reason we do it that way, rectangular plates, is they're computationally efficient. So we can sort of do it in real time with, um, instead of trying to do other more complex shapes. So after that, obviously, um, Trialsmin was taken over, um, I think this basically led to Trialsmin being taken over by Heron, and Heron were quite enthused um, by downhole geophysics after the success at Kate, and they started looking around the deposit. And um, they were like, well, where else can we find some more extensions? And so I, um, I suggested we, we drill to miss, and that's probably one of the least, that's, that's a suggestion I make periodically, and it's always incredibly unpopular, because no one wants to have a drill hole but um, uh, Heron were willing to sort of drill a hole. And the reason for doing that is you can get, EM is very good at telling you how close something is and, um, or how far you've missed it. And if you drill right through it, sometimes you can't get that really good indication of size where this gets you a, a much, by drilling to miss, you can sort of, um, I suppose, get a better indication of size and the exact extent in a certain direction. So this is B lens over this side. And the idea was that B lens might extend much further north. There was no drilling that indicated that it didn't extend north. So I said, so they, I said, drill, drill, drill optimistic. Let's go hundred meters north of, of B lens and see. And you can see they got some of that same stringery sort of thing in the hole, but nothing exciting. And, um, these are the EM models, and we did a we drilled a few more holes after that. That's why there's multiple models. And basically, once the um, once this area is drilled out, um, it's 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 adding at least another million tons onto the um, the resource model. So, if we we did quite a, probably about maybe 50 holes of downhole EM all over the mine, and um, these are the downhole EM plates from up shallow. These are some very shallow near surface mineralization. There's some more extensions. 
when you put it all together, the drilling plus the EM, they are able to get a, a new resource which looks like this. These load up, so that's the the modified resource, and you can see how much of that is is relied upon the EM. And this is, you know, it's a perfect target for EM. It's a resistive host rock, moderately conductive targets. I should say that they're they're conductive, but they're not conductive like WA conductive. They're conductive like we. It's better to use a core or a receiver for this type of realization. It's it's quite a complex thing to talk about, but I'll just say better using a core receiver because you get a better result for these, these this type of target conductance. Anyway, so that's the Woodlawn example. So back to our PowerPoint now. Um, so I just do this. Yep. So overall, we added about um, about two, two and a half million, something like two and a half million tons of that. And that's the reason why Woodlawn is in the process of turning into a mine. Now. So the next problem is a case of trying to find a specific set of mineralization right next to a gigantic ore body. So Broken Hill is obviously a world-class ore body, 120 million tonnes, of, I think it's 18% combined lead zinc. And, um, and in this particular project, we were working on the Northern Mine. So the North Mine, Broken Hill is a long section, it's shaped like a boomerang. The Southern end plunges at about 30 degrees, the Northern end plunges at about 60, so it gets deep fast. And of course, it's uh, all of it, the entire ore body is directly under the town of Broken, the township of Broken itself, Broken Hill itself. So what we did in this case, we're working on the northern part of the, um, the north, so it's actually northeast in real world coordinates. And, um, and the question was that these zinc loans, they're right next to the, the, the sort of the massive lead zinc sea lens. The question was were the zinc loans, which are slightly separated stratigraphically, but not from, not from a perspective of, um, and sort of like a ribbon, yeah, a ribbon of mineralization, whether these could potentially be um, linked together to form a continuous, contiguous high grade zinc. And they were talking, they're quite high grade, 10 to 18% zinc in the zinc loads. But the problem was the rib, ribbon nature. So on one section, you could drill it on the next section, it'd be slightly up dip or down dip and you'd miss it. And they were, they were looking at 600 to 200, 400 meter holes, depending on where you were on the north mine which makes a really difficult drilling target and really hard to prove whether or not the zinc loads were going to be an economic option. I think the zinc price here was also very good. So what we did is we, the zinc loads actually come to surface. So we got a transmitter, put a transmitter electrode, just literally dig a hole, fill it full of um, salt water and foil and pieces of uh, metal and, um, and then Uh, and then plug the wire into those pieces, those bits of metal that you bag into the ground and then fence it all off so no one um, goes and stands in the middle of it with a fair bit of um, dangerous flagging. Exact same thing as what you do for IP transmitter. In fact, so the transmitter that you use for downhill MMR is an IP transmitter. So, and then we had our downhill MMI uh, wire laid out like this. And the reason you take it far away is because the wire has its own magnetic field. You want to get that magnetic field away from what you're actually measuring. And then we found this drill hole here, NM6035, and lowered an electrode, in this case, a big, water, a big copper pipe, about two metres long, down to the, um, this is an uncased hole. So we lowered it down to where this um, hole had intersected the zinc loads. So that way, what we were doing, it's, I think my dipole, my MMR figure has shifted a bit. What we were doing is actually selectively energizing the zinc loads and hopefully, the idea was to hopefully not energize the neighboring, only 30 to 50 meters away, but much larger um, zinc sphalerite sea lens. So here we go in long section. In the Gossen at surface, at the southern end and at the northeastern end down the bottom at 550 meters down in M6035. So this is the main, you can see it's been mined out, but it would still be a, a good EM conductor. So we didn't want to see this stuff. If you have just surface electrodes, you can do downhill MR with surface electrodes. Sometimes the electrical current is gonna find a lot easier to go through this much bigger and um, potentially much bigger 
Zealand. This is our downhill MMR, works very similar to downhill EM, except instead of having a transmittal loop on the surface, you inject your current through the ground and it channels, it relies upon current channeling through anything less or more conductive than the surrounding host rock. It has an advantage on EM that it can see things that aren't hugely conductive. EM needs things that are in absolute terms good conductors, where MMR, it just has to be more conductive than the host rock and you'll get a preferential current channeling. Use the same thing with the downhole receiver. You can also do it um, with a surface receiver. I don't know if you guys have heard of SAM or total field magnetometric conductivity. That's basically the surface version of, of MMR. And they've had great success with that because they use it to map shear zones and they can, it even works through conductive lake sediments and all sorts of exciting things like that. So um, that's, our, that's the basic principle of MMR. And it worked an absolute treat. So this is um, three component data. We did three component probes, so we've got three component data. And this is um, the um, this is the main mine mineralization. Well, you can see it down this red blob down the end. We are getting a bit of a response from it, but most of the response is related to the actual the zinc loans, which were at this sort of stratigraphic boundary between these um, different units. And uh, we also got two little responses up here, and what they are. Is, the, is a couple of railway lines. So obviously a railway line is a good, um, it, it parallels the ore body, so it's a pretty good electrical conductor. It, it, it's happily con conductor, so it sort of, it channels the um, electricity pretty well. But the fact that these responses are so small is related to the fact that our electrode was plugged into the, um, the southern end of the ore body, so it didn't, it, it wasn't just going along the surface. And there we go, there's our resulting um, downhill MMR polygons, which gave them drill targets for deciding whether or not the, um, the zinc loads should be or, or could be further, um, further developed from surface drilling or if they needed to go underground and just drill from in the mine. The mine at that stage wasn't, that mine wasn't open. What time have we got now? Oh, crumbs, going a bit lot slowly. Hmm. I'll do this one and then I'll skip the next one because I don't want to go over time. So problem three is um, this was it's not so much a problem. The problem was only that we didn't find the that there wasn't an ore body. So this is a southern leaders. Leases is the opposite end of Broken Hill, and in this case, um, here's the south mine. There, it was uh, we were working a long down plunge from the known ore body. So pretty hot area if you're talking about anything, but you're also talking deep. So we were already very deep. Now John had noted, noticed back in the day that, um, that there was an, one single two kilometer hole that had been surveyed with downhill EM by using the new Mont PEM survey. It would have been the, one of the first EM surveys really in this area in 1984. And based on, there wasn't a lot of information, but based on just looking at the, he thought that maybe um, the transmitter loop had been directly above where the target was. Now, if you're looking for a vertical target, I mentioned before, you don't want to have your transmitter loop directly above. So, um, so they, so he decided, they, he suggested they should clear out and resurvey. Now, that didn't happen until I became involved in the project in about 2009, I think it was, or maybe 2012, I can't quite remember. No, it might have been 2009, that's right. I mean, you really, this, this target stood up on Oldham. It was in the right location. They had the right alteration. It was even in a bit of a flexure in the amphibolites, which is often associated with where you find the Broken Hill mineralization. It had the right geochemistry, it had the blue, blue garnites, I think they're called. Um, it had everything. And so here's this hole here. It's a two kilometer hole, very, very deep. So, we, so they cleaned it out. You can imagine the size of the drill rig. There's a, you can see a little bit of a drill rig here. It was huge. They cleaned it out and we did the downhole EM survey and um, with a fair bit of information and we got this response. Now this response is typical of a big intersection response and the size of the conductor is 400 by 400 metres. So if you're going to get excited about anything, a huge conductor directly along strike from Broken Hill is about as exciting as it gets and you know this is a pretty good bit of the data. 
Now, drilling, however, wasn't that exciting. The first wedge missed it, like, like by 100 metres. And then, so we're talking, remember we're talking two and a half kilometre long holes here. So there's nothing cheap about any of this. Second wedge missed it again. And the third wedge hit it and intersected basically disseminated pyrotype. So unfortunately, we've got no indication that there's significant base metals. Right. Well, this is the last one. Last one, this one I'm, I'm very limited about what I can talk about. It's overseas, it's in a, a country with, um, you know, a lot of problems. So I'm not gonna say about where it is or who it was for, but it's an excellent example of the challenges we're, we have finding, finding mineralization at depth. And in this case, it's a success, success story, unlike the Broken Hill one. This is one of the main challenges, the cow problem, and that's a typical problem in, uh, in uh, surveys. So my mate, um, Martin Jones, who I've worked with for many years, called me up and said, I've got this project, we've got some really good geochemistry, and I think it'd be a, a good um, application to look for some geophysics over my geochemical anomalies um, to, to see if there's sort of some, some encouragement. And, and I said that really we should strongly consider an IP survey because, um, It's funny, when I'm doing the presentation this way, none of the, um, the, uh, the animations are coming up, which is a bit frustrating. Anyway, all right. So, um, I said, well, let's do an IP survey. So we did this IP survey um, and it was a big survey. This is about three kilometers, well, probably about two and a half by two and a half, three kilometers. And this is a depth relation with a chargeability. It was very noisy data. The only equipment we could get into this into the country on a reasonable time frame and from and for reasonable price was um, a relatively low power IP system. And so we I spent a lot of time um, inverting and reinverting the data. What I'll do here is I was actually switched to NCOM PA because then you can see it better than what it's currently. Um, PowerPoint's letting me down. I have to say, so. So that's all we had, that was the information. They had some geochemistry. And I said, well, what sort of depth do you think this, um, this thing would be at? He said, oh, you know, I want to be able to see down to, to 800 meters. So uh, I suggested to Martin that we, we do an IP survey. So that's what we did. This is our chargeability sliced at 400 meters below surface. And this is the existing drilling. So I looked at those and I made recommendations about which targets to drill. Um, this particular anomaly, and this is a quick side journey, um, inversions are always dodgy. Take them with 10 bags of salt each one. This particular anomaly over here would disappear and re reappear depending on how you set the inversion up. And so an example of, um, of just inversions being dodgy, you know, just remember they are not the truth. They are one version of the truth. So, these are the results sliced and you can see the different anomalies and they drilled these drill holes here. All these drill holes were based on the geophysical anomaly. So these holes are that labeled according to their depth and you can see there's a 500 meter, 700 meter hole. So a quite an expensive and slow drilling program given the, um, the drilling technology in this company. And the holes got basically nothing, like nothing. And, um, and I looked at the drill and we, they'd intersected pyrite. IP indicates pyrite, pointed by Steve Collin, it's perfectly correct. And I said in the report, guys, you've, you've explained your IP anomalies and you've got pyrite, but what you haven't, because this is a VHMS target, you really should do some downhole EM on those drill holes to see if there is an actual VHMS within the, the smoke cloud that is the, um, the disseminator pyrite halo, if that makes sense. 
And I really didn't, I've, I, I will say that in every report for this type of um, project, and I would say most people wouldn't follow that recommendation because the idea is, is that geophysics has been done, the budget for geophysics has been spent, and so then to follow up and, and find another 100 or $200,000 to do another whole series of holes, and this is hard, this area, it takes six weeks to get the, the gear into the country often and things like that, so it's, sometimes it's easier just to, you know, maybe drill another hole or just not do anything else, give the prospect up. But Martin is, um, is pretty wise when it comes to the, uh, the geophysical game. And um, he's been seen, seen, a, seen it used quite well. So he, to much to my surprise, they managed, it all went ahead and they asked me to design the, the downhill M. Now I covered myself in glory again. By this stage, I did not think that Martin would be talk to me ever again, because when the crew got into the country, um, they couldn't get down any of the holes. All the holes were blocked. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna close the door. And essentially, um, so that's a good way to lose, you know, <laughs> you just paid, spent six weeks trying to get a crew into the country and they can't get down any of the holes. Even though the holes were cased, it was such a mobile ground with such high fluid flow that, um, that they, that they were blocked. Luckily, they were able to clear out some of them. This one over here, this pink one, that has um, had metal casing. Tip for new players, metal casing and downhole EM don't go together. And you can see most of the holes were blocked, including this hole, 7314. It was blocked at about 450 metres. What you might be able to just see in this um, particular hole, in 717, is that the EM, pro, EM um, field increases with amplitude at depth. And the only way to explain that is a large off-hole conductor. Now, I knew I was near a regional structure that did have sulfides on it. So there was a part of me that was doing the same thing that it did it would want. Oh, it's probably just this or it's probably just that. But I did a model anyway. And that's, that model looks a lot like the other ones, actually. <laughs> square, re bright red square rectangle. Well, at least it's consistent. We do, we are stuck with that. Anyway, about um, two years later, maybe, Martin called me up and he said, I want you to design another downhole EM survey. And I was like, oh yeah, all right, no worries. Give me, send me the whole details. So he sent me the whole details and he sent me the whole coordinates. And I, and I thought, well, first, my first thought was like, geez, these guys were suckers of punishment. We didn't find much last time. We didn't find much in the, e, um, the IP and I'd completely forgotten about this thing, but I, about this red conductor. But I looked, um, in the, uh, as I was doing this downhill EM survey, I looked at the coordinates, I was like, geez, those coordinates sound familiar, like, and so I went and found my last report I'd written, and, um, and sure enough, there'd, there'd been a big, a big conductor in, um, in that area, and I called up Martin, I said, did that, did that hole actually intersect anything? And he said, oh yeah. <laughs> 30 metres, it's sort of 2%, two, 2.5% two, two copper. You know, and um, I was like, well, is that good? And he was like, yeah, I suppose. And so it was a pretty exciting day for me. I think I was in Hong Kong, I bounced around a bit. But just to give you an indication, like it's easy, that, that, sort of, that sort of makes it seem a lot easier than what it is. But what it doesn't show you is they tried, they, they could have stopped. There were so many points where they could have stopped on this. So you could say that 717 had intersected its response and it had, it got some massive pile right down the bottom of the hole. So you could say, look, that's, that's not a target, we've intersected it, right? And it's in, it's in, the, middle of, um, it's in the middle of the chargeability high, so you can see where it sits, right? You could say, we've, we've definitely explained this anomaly, we don't need to do any work. But I always say, when you're drilling EM conductors, you have to drill the middle. So that's what they did. So the first hole, this, this hole 434, it was blocked. It actually, um, it, it collapsed or something and they couldn't, they couldn't continue it. But instead of giving up, they kept on drilling. Now the second hole didn't really lift as much. So this is, I think this is um, percent pyrite actually, or percent sulfides, I think maybe, the colouring. But it did intersect a significant width of, of sulfides, but not a, not a huge amount of, um, of copper, only about five metres at 2.2% copper. So you could say, look, we've explained our, it's too deep at 700 metres below surface, it's too deep, we've explained our EM conductor and you could drop, drop it at that point. But they kept on going. And they finally drilled this hole, and this hole intersected a good, so that was the main, the one that gave all the copper, a very good, excellent intersection. Since then, we did obviously a lot more drilling, 
which really looks like that now. And it's quite interesting to compare the downhill EM models with the actual ore model. So it sort of gives you an indication of how, how well they are resolved. Interestingly, the downhill EM strongly suggests, this ore model is based on subsequent drilling. The downhill EM strongly suggested that the mineralization continued in this direction. So later on, um, I can probably go back to my PowerPoint now. We did a, um, there we go. They did another IP survey, about one and a half kilometers along from that, that ore model. And that IP survey showed another deep target. Now this deep target plots at about 600 meters below surface, but if you continue the ore model down plunge, the actual ore zone should be about a thousand meters below surface. So they did, um, they targeted this, this IP anomaly here with a drill hole. And, um, and you can see this drill hole they got, they drilled through what they thought were the IP anomaly and got nothing really. So we did the downhole EM survey. First downhole EM survey went to 7.6 and you could see the amplitude and the signal increasing with depth. And so I said, I did the model and I said, you have to drill at least another 150 meters. The next drill hole got to 8.60 and it was such deep. Oh yep, yeah, right. I have to, have to share, wrong, wrong screen, I'll go back. Thanks guys. All right, so we drilled it, we did this IP survey here, found this lovely IP anomaly, but it was at 600 meters by surface, drilled through it and, um, and basically, got to 840 meters they, they I think they lost a bit of faith um, I would say and so we did another another downhole EM survey on the same hole and um, I said well guys you know you're still about 100 meters away from it remembering what the survey from the previous hole looks like so it's a very similar story it's the same story again except just deeper this time and here it is we last survey we did we uh, we did it at about nine, this is at 980 meters, and you can see the signal's just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And I said, you're about 10 meters away or 20 meters away from the ore, and they intersected the ore at, uh, at about 1,000 meters below surface. And that's just a continuation of this same, same ore body, and it's just fantastic. So, this is just um, a bit of a... Uh, so this is um, just a bit of fun fact. Um, sometimes you don't even need a transmitter loop with, with EM. For this particular area, because there's um, earth return power line systems, we can turn the transmitter loop off and map the ore using just the electrical current flowing th through the ground from the, tr from the power, power lines. So look at that. So that's the EM response from, we've done tons of downhill EM servers there now, so we know it pretty well, but this is the EM response. It's an intersection response. That's an off-hole response from something above the hole. And that's a off-hole response from something, sorry, something, this one over here is an off-hole something below the hole. And this is an off-hole response from something above the hole. And that's, um, I will one day write a paper about that because it's, it's pretty cool for any geophysicist in the audience. It's a great, great nerd out. It's, the, the amplitude of this field at depth was up to 20 nanoteslas. So with 1,000 metres by surface, you've got 20 nan nanoteslas of power line. Like, you don't get that if you stand on an ether power line. So it was quite impressive. So this is, that's it for me, guys. Sorry for going over time. Um, apparently, I can talk to myself quite effectively, um, or at least rabbit on forever. Here's a bunch of photos of geophysics. And um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to... Um, to answer anything, I saw. I saw yeah, thanks. thanks hey, I, I'll go. We'll get the questions going in a second. I'll, I'll just jump in with one quick one before we get to the ones that are there. Um, what would you rate as the most reliable and the least reliable of the methods? Yeah, I think that that it has to be. It, it it's like everything. You know, you can say with geochemistry, there's, you know, it depends on the environment you're in and what you, what type of target you're looking for. So you don't always do ionic leach. You don't always do MMI. Like there's all different um, types of applications. So 
you know, like if you're looking for porphyry coppers, you don't run around necessarily necessarily think that EM is your first option because the mineralization is probably a disseminated sulfide. Um, if you're looking for for a, um, a VHMS, you can get much better results from EM than you can for IP, at least in terms of ore delineation. But if you're actually looking for just to get you for just to get in the area, if you like going from semi regional to regional to prospect scale, maybe maybe using something like um, an airborne EM survey might be suitable. But I for that that example um, that last example that area had been covered with airborne EM. So when you see an airborne EM, I mean I know that the airborne EM contractors misrepresent how deep they can see with their systems. But this thing is huge. It's like, it's one and a half kilometers, it's like four kilometers long, it's highly conductive. It's very, 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 um, uh, um, it's, it's, it's extremely good conductor. And it wasn't seen with airborne EM simply because of the limitations of, a, of an EM system, which is flying along at hundred kilometers per hour. So I would say, like, I'd probably say that airborne EM is probably the least reliable, but it's the most efficient in terms of, area coverage. I wouldn't say there's any, I think if you want to, reliability of a geophysical technique sort of has to be filtered through by a geophysicist because they'll tell you um, whether or not it is reliable for a certain target versus maybe not for another one. Um, so always good to seek uh, some friendly advice before you design a program. Yes and yeah and and neuro geo, you've heard of neurology where, where neuro geophysics doesn't work very well either. Like just because someone else has done an airborne the M survey doesn't mean necessarily you should. Yeah. There is. All right, thanks, Kate. Um, we've got a few from the floor as well. Um, Philip Thomas asks, would you use IP for a gold vein structure where there is only seven or eight veins in the sedimentary strata uh, where there is no graphite? Uh, if there was, a, if it had a lot of like pyrite, disseminated pyrite around it, then yes, but usually no. The gold vein, gold in veins is usually a very narrow target, and IP is generally not that well suited for finding narrow, not particular chargeable. Not maybe it's a bit resistive. Um, I'm working on a project right now actually where they've done high resolution IP for very near surface mapping resistive gold reefs actually so the gold is in quartz um, reefs and so that's what they've done the resistivity it's an ip it's called ip resistivity so the resistivity has done a good job mapping the quartz reefs but it's a gradient to race survey and the effective depth and investigation with the 20 meter dipoles is very limited so um i'd say that uh, yeah i i would say not generally um sam has been used a lot for for mapping the structures that post um post gold so yeah, because of that fact, it doesn't need them to be absolutely good conductors. It just needs to be the need the structure that needs to be a better conductor than um, than the surrounding um, surrounding rocks. If that makes sense. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Doug Young. Asks, and someone else has also uh, liked this question. Um, in the Broken Hill case, are there lead uh, are the lead loads more conductive? Lead loads more conductive than the zinc loads, and can you differentiate them? Definitely the lead loads are way more conductive. They're still not great conductors, but they're certainly good conductors, say 400 Siemens compared to the zinc. In fact, the zinc loads is almost invisible to EM in most cases um, at Broken Hill because they're just too resistive. That's why we use this magnetometric resistivity instead of the, um, the EM. Sphalerite is not a conductor, so um, it just doesn't, it doesn't rate. Even at Woodlawn, um, they have some lenses at Woodlawn that are basically just phalarite and you pretty much can't see them with the with the EM. But the ones, as long as it gets to at Woodlawn, we did a lot of we looked at this a lot. And um, if you've got Galena lens, you'll get a weak conductor, just a Galena sphalerite lens, it'll be a weak conductor, but it still can be sort of resolved. And if it's got a bit of copper in it, then it really lights up really quite well. Copper's a big control on, on conductivity, at least in the VHMS setting. In Broken Hill, there's not a lot of copper around, but the lenses are so thick and they're so massive that you are quite, the lead lenses, I should say, that you did get a lovely response from them. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, I see one more question from Tim Kohler. Do you know if geophysics was used to find the Timok near Bor in East Serbia? And if so, what method? It starts at 400 metres below surface and goes to about 2,400 metres. It's all through copper. 
No, I actually don't know off the top of my head. Um, but I would say that probably the only things that would work at that depth for that type of water deposit would be sort of high power IP. And there's different types of IP, but this might be one of them. And, um, and MT. So the MIMDAS system actually measures MT as well. And, um, and there's been a lot of work recently with, with trying to use geophysics to find very large. Porphyry is one of the few things you have a chance of finding with, at depth. So with IP, the resolution is roughly one half the depth of, the depth of burial. So um, you start to think you need something to be pretty big when, when it gets pretty deep for it to be resolved very well. So um, I think that if, if anything was going to work, that'd be either MT and or obviously magnetics can be very effective as well um, for the potassium zone at porphyry coppers. But the um, the larger the larger target is the sericitic pyrite alteration on the outer part. So the only problem with IP for porphyry coppers is some, sometimes you find that sericite pyrite and then you have to scratch your head and go, well maybe the best IP response is not actually the best drill target because the drill target, you want the chalka pyrite and the, the actual volume of sulphide is lower in the chalka pyrite zone than it is in the pyritic, sericitic clay pyrite zone. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, question from uh, Michael, uh, what would you offer as an effective method for a semi-entrained zinc lead sulphide scan with associated magnetite and some proximal pyrotite pyrite? So semi-entrained, I don't know what that means. Um, zinc lead sulfide scan. So is proximal mean that it's like very close? A little bit of pyrotite. It's a beautiful, pyrotite really turns things into lovely, lovely conductors. Um, if it is close enough to your ore zone, then you'd be able to map the pyrotite nicely. Downhole magnetics can be a, um, quite effective for mapping, getting sort of information about where your magnetite is. So if you think the magnetite is associated with your mineralization, then that be quite, could be quite useful. Um, yeah, if, assuming we're talking, um, obviously surface magnetics would be a pretty basic, you know, you want to have a good surface mag map. Uh, yeah, I, I would probably start there, think about, um, if, if the pyrotide is, is with the Z and zinc and lead, then it's pyrotide has a tendency to turn things into lovely conductors. That's what you saw at the Broken Hill example. We just had rock, but it had a bit of pyrotide in it, and that was enough to turn, give me a great big <laughs> EM response. So um, just some network pyrotide, yeah. Hey Kate, I've got a question for you. Um, those were lots of examples where geophysics was good. Do you have any ugly ones? Like, have there been many cases in your career where you've done a survey and got absolutely nothing? Well, I mean, I would say finding a gigantic lump of pyrotite at two kilometres below surface and d drilling three two kilometre holes is a pretty awful, um, awful... I don't know. I, th I think that it could have been a lot worse. You could have gotten nothing and just been like, well, that was, you know, that didn't work at all. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it could have not had a response, but <laughs> it was a pretty, pretty expensive... Um, Pretty expensive. I mean, I suppose it was a good area to drill anyway. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, I've had plenty of examples where, it, I mean, there are pretty good, plenty of examples where it didn't work. I've done resistivity surveys, trying to map soft, trying to map where limestone was weathered versus fresh. And because that was a limestone mine and it's just all the maps was variations in porosity of the ground. It didn't really map where the limestone was, where the whole thing was to map the fresh limestone. So they knew where they had fresh limestone and it utterly failed. Um, it seemed like a really simple applica application. It didn't, didn't work at all. I mean, sometimes when you don't find, like if you don't get an anomaly, um, maybe there's nothing there to find. <laughs> no. Um, I, you know, we you hear a lot from um, geologists uh, along the lines of, oh, you know, we drilled this IP anomaly and we got nothing and we can never explain it. Oh, yes. Uh, well, that's, that's one of the things with, um, I would say that's peculiar, particularly problematic with, with IP, to a lesser extent, EM, is, is the anomalies are relative. So you sort of don't get a um, sense of the abs absolute quality of an anomaly. It's just, it's just the best anomaly in an area. I would say, yeah, probably IP is probably the biggest one prone to that, is getting a, um, 
you know, you've just, it, it can give you responses to clay. And if there's nothing better, that's what you're mapping is clay. And really no one's going to be that excited about, about some clay. It doesn't matter how good they uh, plenty of, I've done plenty of airborne EM surveys where the overburden, we didn't think there was any conductive overburden, but there's so much conductive overburden that the system is, you're not seeing anything below the surface essentially. So that's a lot of, a lot of money and, and no, no effective results. Um, and also lots of, particularly up around, the, around um, well, particularly in Australia and some, somewhat in Saudi Arabia, there's lots of just pyritite, you know, like in these cratonic shields, you just get blobs of, I don't know why they're there, but just pyritite. And it's, there's no mineralization, it's just pyritite. And so you find lovely strong conductors and they're just pyritite. And so you can, and that's one of the risks of airborne EM is you get 50 bazillion thousand kilometers of, 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 of um, data and you have 50 billion anomalies and you sort of don't know, it's hard to pick the, the good one from all the other ones. And particularly when there's little bits of pyritite left, right and center. Drilled lots of puritite in my career. Something like a technical success. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, we, we've gone a fair bit over time, so we might leave it there. Um, thanks very much for your time, Kate. And I see uh, Michael Jones, uh, uh, Marty Jones was there uh, on the list of watch, uh, watching, so maybe you can catch up with him and, uh, and, and discuss a little bit further about some of those comments you made. All right, no problem. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Uh, thanks all, and uh, we'll see you for the next one in uh, early next month. All right. Thank you. Good night.